Good afternoon, everyone in real estate land. Welcome back to the Real Estate Rundown with Shannon Robnett. Today, my guest is Andrew from the House Hacking Podcast. Uh, as you guys might guess, Andrew started hacking houses at a young age of about 20, uh, buying his first property before he was even done drying behind the ears. He was 20 years old when he had his first property. And from there, grew to a portfolio of about 40 units before he decided to transition from there into other deals and has basically going to talk to us a little bit today about how to make the lifestyle work for you, pick and choose what you want to get the lifestyle you want out of this game we call real estate. So welcome, Andrew. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. I'm excited to be on with you and I appreciate you reaching out to get me on your show. Well, when you've got a, when you've got a, podcast named the house hacking podcast and you know you guys you millennials right i mean i, I don't you're, you're younger than i am we'll just leave it at that you millennials have these really cool names because you know when i bought my first house i was 19 years old i was going to college and and i got roommates and we didn't call it house hacking house hacking sounds really cool we called it broke as hell we called it no freaking yeah, yeah. You know, but you guys, you guys, millennials come up with a lot of cool names like, like house hacking. So tell us about your first, how, how did you get started in multifamily? How did you get started in rental real estate? Give us the, the five minute version of how Andrew got started. It was all by an accident. So at 19 years old, I was working as a telemarketer in the mortgage banking industry and quickly transitioned to being a loan officer. And then you know, here I am day in and day out doing loans for people buying a house. And I realized, you know, I'm getting ready to go rent an apartment with my friend and the cost for an apartment. I know I can get a loan and qualify and go buy a house for the same, you know, and have the same monthly housing costs or less. So then that clicked. And then the next thing was, well, I was going to split the rent with my buddy why don't I just have him pay me rent instead? And now all of a sudden my housing costs are reduced and you know, you get all the benefits of owning a house. You get the appreciation, the equity pay down, the write off. So it was not like I had some grand plan or anything. It just sort of made sense where instead of going to renting, why don't I go buy and get a roommate to help cover those, those housing costs for me. You know, it's funny uh, how many times I've heard, the accidental investor story, something just very similar to yours where, you know, it wasn't that they, they got Robert Kiyosaki drilled into their head at 12 or, you know, their parents were big real estate moguls. They just kind of got started and the light bulb went on and they went from there. So how did you go from, from one house and a roommate as an accidental investor to having 40 homes of your own that you were managing and owning? Yeah. Uh, well, there's a bit of a transition period there. And really what it was is I was making great money, but hated life and just sort of got burnt out working in the mortgage industry and realized this sort of volunteer trip I took to go help clean out flooded homes in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I realized, hey, this is a lot more fun. Why don't I make a transition and do that? And then all of a sudden I gave up the six figure income from mortgage banking and then had nothing and the nonprofit. And I said, whoa, whoa, wait a second. So there's got to be a blend between the two of how can I make a good living, still do something that I love, make a positive impact. And then that's what really caused me to dive into real estate investing head first. I had the mortgage background. I had met appraisers, real estate agents, insurance, but I didn't have that, you know, how do you analyze a property? How do you, you know, figure this out? And I just started going through my network of, of friends and I said, you know, I, I'm this is what I'm trying to do. Here's my problem. I need more money, but I don't know how to do that. I think there's something with real estate. And I had a guy I was meeting with. He goes, Andrew, you know, you, you've been having lunch with this civic group for years. You need to go talk with Bill. And I was like, well, Bill's a retired scientist. He worked with like the EPA. Why, why do I want to go talk with him? And he goes, well, Bill and his wife own a hundred plus properties. You know, they're one of the biggest landlords in the area. Um, and all of a sudden I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, never would have thought. Super humble guy. He loved his Mercedes. He had a brand new Mercedes every year. But outside of that, you know, he was that millionaire next door, lived in the same right. house for 30 plus years. 
and I called him up and I said, look, you know, Bill, here's what I, I'm trying to do. And he said, Andrew, come on up to the, the country club for lunch and we'll sort of give you the spill of real estate. What worked for us, what didn't work. And he literally went through, here's what we did in the 70s, what we did in the 80s, what we did in the 90s, what we did in the early 2000s. Wow, that's and that an sort of opened gift. up my world to really dive in. in. You know, and, and that's the funny thing that I've seen so often with real estate. You know, you, you hear of all these stock gurus or all of these, you know, self-help guys that if you'll pay them money, they'll teach you. But I've really found uh, through my journey and through talking with a lot of people uh, that, you know, the journey of real estate is more like a group effort. And there's so many bills in the world that are willing to lay it out for a young guy because they see the potential, they see themselves 30 years ago, but you don't see that, at least that's been my experience. Have you seen that where people in the stock market or people in the you know, other professions don't really want you to know how they do what they do, but in real estate, it's kind of like, we're not each other's competition, let me help you. You know, it's very rare outside of the real estate industry, luckily, you know, even in the real estate industry, there's some competitiveness or someone's out there saying, well, I got to sell my course. But most folks I have found, if you build that relationship, they want to help each other out. I mean, that's why I started the House Hacking Podcast was when folks ask me, how do I get started in real estate or how can I get ahead financially without being a giant real estate investor? My answer always was do a house hack. And what Bill yeah. and several others did for me, I said, look, why don't I do the House Hacking Podcast? I'll cover the cost of the hosting and the production. And that's sort of my way to give back. But yeah. you're very right. It, outside of real estate, I found it's very rare for people to be so open and willing to help each other. So you're, what, probably 23, 24 years old at this time. You've sat down with Bill. You're kind of dialing it in. You're doing, the, you're doing the nonprofit thing, but you're paying your bills with the, with the houses. What, what was your next steps from there, Andrew? It was another house hack. You know, I had part of this is you just got to be, I think, open to what's happening around you. And I realized where I was living at the time in North Carolina, there was these condos that operated like a multifamily. And one of the things Bill had told me was, he goes, Andrew, if I could do it all over again, I would have started investing in multifamily, small multifamily, medium, big doesn't matter, multifamily, I would have done that sooner. So I found these condos that at the time, you know, this was 2009, 2010, that were selling for $90,000 each. They were by a university and you could buy them for that $90,000 and then you can rent them by the room to students for 400 bucks each. Oh, wow. So you're getting a $90,000 property grossing 1600 a month. Wow. And you'd have to cover utilities. And I said, well, look, I could live in one room, rent out the other three. Now I'm living for free. And at the time, I was traveling around the world doing disaster response work. I was in Indonesia. I was in the Philippines. I was in Haiti. So I needed a free place to stay and a way to sort of have um, you know, income coming in. So that's what I started. And I said, you know, if I'm in my late 20s, I don't mind college kids. You know, like I still relate to that. If someone, you know, the drunk frat bro gets drunk and punches a hole in the wall. That's not a big deal to me. Like I can patch that easy to do. So like I found a target demographic and a geographic area that I was comfortable with and could relate with. And then I really just dove into that sort of college rental market and, and grew my portfolio from there. And how big did your portfolio get from there, Andrew? I had 12 rentals, a mix of single families and condos with the um, college housing. And then along at the same line, I also started investing in affordable housing. And that's where I picked up those other 24 rental units that, that got me um, you know, up to those uh, 40 units. And sort of, again, going back to an area that I was comfortable with, I had been traveling around the world, working in disaster zones in poor countries from Kenya to Guatemala to Haiti. And I said, well, you know, there's parts of my town that are more lower income. Like I've done community building, community redevelopment, community empowerment. And I said, these houses, these single families, these duplexes, these quads are priced really great. They're meeting the 2% rule, which is super rare nowadays. But there's, everyone was scared of it. 
because it was more challenging. And to me, it just fit with what I was really comfortable with. And then I started buying uh, those properties up. I ran out of money again really quickly and then started <laughs> uh, raising private capital. I, I had a friend that got out of the military and went to be a private contractor. And he goes, Andrew, you know, I'm making 200 grand a year as a private contractor out of the country for 11 months, not spending any money. You know, uh, I heard you're doing this cool real estate thing. Like, can we partner up? I got tons of cash. Like, let's do something. And then he ended up doing joint ventures with me. His dad ended up investing with me. That built the track record where others that would say, look, we'll come in as the silent partner. And then that sort of let me help really scale up. And then, you know, sort of grew, grew from there. So that wasn't the end of your journey, though. That's not where you're at today. There's, there's some more steps in here, right? Oh, yeah. So that, that mix of those 40 units, you know, I was managing 24. And then the other, I, was, I had turned over to a property manager. So I had a hard time finding property management for the lower income. So I started doing that myself until I got to scale. Then I realized, all right, now I can bring in a property manager to take over the system. But even then, you know, I got to the point where you know, out there in the real estate world, everyone has these big goals of like, you got to get to 10 properties, then you got to get to 50, then you got to get to 100, and then you got to get to 1,000. And I all of a sudden realized like, yeah, I had that goal of like shooting for 100 and then growing from there. And I realized like, that wasn't what I wanted. I didn't want to own tons of properties, tons of doors, tons of units. I didn't want to manage uh, dozens to hundreds of tenants. What I wanted was that passive income to help let me have a good lifestyle, know I've got a super comfortable retirement down the road whenever I wanted that to be, to let me have you know, a good, solid financial lifestyle while doing nonprofit work. So what ended up happening is I got really, really lucky with some good timing. Uh, I ended up slowly liquidating my portfolio from 2016 to uh, 20, beginning of 2019. Did some 1031 exchanges, did a failed 1031 exchange. And then I also started, because I could qualify as an accredited investor, started investing in syndications, which gave me that sort of ability to invest in real estate, choose more specifically where I was investing and who I was investing with, and generate that more passive income without having to manage the tenants, without having to manage the property managers, worry about roofs when hurricanes come through, that sort of thing. You know, and that's that, that's funny that you say that. I mean, everybody has the, the dream of, of, you know, having 100 units. And I think Tony Robbins does it best when he just says, you know, let's talk about what you want out of a lifestyle. And what he really drills down into that, that yeah. what you want is a lifestyle to fly on a private jet, to have two weeks on a private island, you know, to work four days a week, to drive a really nice car, to do those things you really don't need millions of dollars. You need a consistent passive income of somewhere a lot less than what you would think. And so you were able to tap that thought process early and have really at this point converted your life to a passive income investor lifestyle. Pretty much, you know, I still manage the house hack that I live in. So I did a third house hack when I moved to new Orleans. It was sort of a first real estate investment for my wife and I together. And then, you know, we just did a fourth house act, you know, with this idea of need a place to live. Let's find a way to have someone else pay for it or offset the cost. And then, um, so I'll still manage my tenants in that, but the rest of it's all invested with other folks. So it gives me that more flexibility and, you know, t touching on Tony Robbins, I'm a huge fan of that. And I love the way he says, well, you don't actually want to own the private island because that costs a lot. You can actually rent the right. private island exactly. for a period of time. And yes, back in my 20s, you know, I got to have that super fancy sports car, the Italian sports car. And then all of a sudden, it's weird how as time goes on, your goals change and what you value. And right. it's like, I'm not at a place where I could afford a private jet, but that's not a goal any longer. I'm like, well, I don't mind flying business class. Business class is awesome nowadays. And you can get just exactly. about anywhere. So I said, that, that's easier to do. And, you know, why, why build up all this other stuff that needs to support that stuff that you value? So it really turned down to, you know, what do you really value more? You know, now where we're at in New Orleans, you know, we can walk everywhere or take an Uber everywhere. You know, we're less than a mile from the French Quarter. Like, if I had a car, you know, 
I barely use a tank of gas as is. Um, so the idea of having a super nice car that would just sit all the time isn't something I value anymore. So, you know, it's weird. You, you can let real estate help drive what to get you what you value, but what you value changes o- over time. So, yeah, it's been a really great lifestyle that it's built for my wife and I. I never get tired of hearing the stories of people that started – you know, uh, your story is very similar to mine. You know, I grew up in a real estate family and here I am, you know, I'm actually a ground up uh, developer. So I build the syndications uh, and, and yet I never get tired of hearing the average person. And I don't mean to call you average, uh, Andrew, because you're not average. The way you live your life is not average, but you didn't start out with a silver spoon in your mouth. You didn't start out with an unlimited checking account. In fact, your story is awesome in the sense that your career path took you into a, a place that was devoid of money. If you're in the nonprofit world, if you're in disaster cleanup in Indonesia, I, I know that doesn't pay well. And, and so here you've been able to do this yeah, yeah. without a day job, right? Without a, without a regular source of income, uh, you've been able to do this because you've been creative and you've been open to what's going on around you. So, I mean, if, if you, I mean, it's like you did a house hack with one hand tied behind your back all the time because you, you had a job that wasn't a great job and it was a fantastic job, but it didn't pay well, I guess is how I'm trying to say that. Well, yeah, my, my starting stipend, you know, uh, a little over a decade ago was $800 a month, just as a point of reference in the nonprofit <laughs> world. So I've obviously gotten paid more than then, but that's sort of this idea, right? Like if you can start with a, a $800 a month stipend and really sort of build a decent real estate uh, empire from there and then build passive income, you know, it, a lot of people can do it. Um, yeah. And I don't take any offense to, to, to your term of average, like maybe some way down the road, I'll do a real estate development, but it's not what's important to me. And it's not something I get super excited about. And I love finding guys like you that love that and get excited about that because I'll partner with you. So, you know, it's, I love that real estate, there's so many different ways to do real estate to make it fit right. what you're interested in. Sort of like right. I started with college housing because I could relate. Then I went into affordable housing because that, that was another area that I could really relate with. It gives you so much opportunity and ways to do it. Um, I've, it's absolutely made a world of difference in, in my life and for me and my wife. Well, and you know, Andrew, to, to hear you say that even in how you decided to pick and buy what you want, I mean, if you, you sound kind of like Warren Buffett buying stocks, right? Warren Buffett buys stocks he likes. He buys stocks that he drinks and he yeah. eats and he uses. And Coca-Cola. Exactly. Candy. You know, yeah. yeah, the stuff he likes, man. I, I'm, I'm buying this because I'm never going to let this candy bar go out of business because I like it, you know. But the whole thought process behind it, and, and you bring such a personal uh, story to this where, you know, you didn't get started in this because you read some great book and you didn't get started in this because you wanted to get to, a millionaire status, you got started in this, and then you saw a way to fund a life of helping others, really helping others, and really stepping out of your comfort zone and being, uh, you know, a caring person in a world that needed more of that. And you still built this empire that allows you to do, I'm assuming you're still doing more of that, um, as this has been able to afford you that luxury of doing what you want when you want because of the diligent things you did with real estate. Absolutely. And it's a pretty interesting thing when you're not afraid of getting fired or you know you can quit any time and not worry about, you know, being paycheck to paycheck. It makes you act differently at a job. And I'm not talking about in this like cocky way where you're disrespectful to, to folks that you work with, but it gives you a different perspective of like, I can take risks. Maybe I wouldn't do this or I wouldn't challenge something, you know, if I was so dependent on a paycheck. And it's actually made, made me more successful in the nonprofit sector where, you know, I took an, uh, the disaster response nonprofit I worked for as their head of development, scaled them from half a million to $3 million a year. You know, that's not something that you can do when you're worried about a paycheck and you're worried about not taking risks. Um, so it's, it's just given me so many opportunities and, it, it makes life a very different, not that you don't have stress anymore, but it's been great. And then it's also let me diversify it outside of real estate where early on every dime I had was to build more real estate, and build more real estate. 
And now it's into maxing out deferred accounts, putting money in a brokerage account, you know, working with another guy. We're looking at investing in a couple different small businesses that could need some liquidity right now, need that extra injection of capital, and need some advice of folks to come in and help them revamp their sales process, revamp their uh, digital marketing campaign. So it's giving me this opportunity to, to invest in other areas as well. So it's, it's been pretty phenomenal. But, you know, Andrew, the one thing that I hear you consistently saying is you, you are an investor of the human capital as well. I mean, you're really keying in on, you know, helping people in disaster situations. Um, you know, Section 8 housing that you were involved with was the stuff that nobody wanted to touch but still wanted to affect the quality of life. Now you're looking at giving business advice and being the apprentice type show where you're, you know, you're coming in, you're bringing the capital and you're bringing the advice to, to really help a business grow. and you know, that's just, that's just a phenomenal story, man. I mean, and kudos to you for recognizing that you're not the kind of person, you could still be at that six-figure job grinding away and, and have done so much. But on the other side, when you look back at your life, I don't think you regret leaving that. But then, and then you have all the other stories and all the other, the, all the other richness that you brought into your life by doing it your way. I mean, seriously. What a fantastic story you've got. It may make it even a little, little better for you. I was going to say, so I had actually met my wife doing disaster response work. So if I hadn't left that really good paying job, I wouldn't have met this woman that ended up being my wife. So there you go. You know, when you start putting you know, your time and effort and things that you value, good, good things come to you. Yeah. Well, and you know, Andrew, when, when, you're sitting here looking at it and, you know, I, I know we all can do this because when we get to certain places in our life, we can always see where maybe we could have taken a little bit shorter route or we could have done things a little bit different. What would you say for my, for my listeners, what would you say the number one piece of advice you're going to give that person that's, that's asking you, how do you make this a little bit better than what you did? Yeah. I mean, from the personal side, it's, it's mastering your personal finances. You know, if you can't, you know, master getting paid three grand a month, you're not going to do it at 10 grand a month. I learned that very on when I was in the mortgage industry. You know, I do a loan for someone that made 50 grand a year. Their finances looked almost identical to the person making 250,000 a year. Just the person that made 250 a year had the bigger house, they had the bigger toys, but they were just as much in debt. Their debt ratios were almost identical. Um, so, mastering that personal finance. And then on the real estate side, I'm a big believer in you need to self-manage a couple properties. You don't need to do it long-term, but if you can learn that and understand the people side of, of the real estate business, now all of a sudden it lets you manage a property manager better. If you invest in a syndicator, you understand what they're dealing with when they work with the property manager you understand what it is to have to do a maintenance call from a broken pipe in the middle of the night. You know, I had two different property fires, you know, wow. I had to deal with that. That made me learn. So I would say, you know, manage a tenant for at least a year or two and get the hang of it and see what the challenges are. And that'll make you a better investor. You know, and I couldn't agree more with you on this last project we did. We, we had a property management company come in, and they were just, they were a disaster. And because I had that experience and because I've done that, we were able to fire that company. I hired a, a guy I knew in the market that I had always admired. And we were able to bring that in, smooth the deal out, lease the units for more money, lease them faster, actually ultimately uh, increase the value of the property. It was 180 unit ground up development. We increased the value of the property almost 20% over projections because we were able to manage with that knowledge you're talking about of exactly what that tenant wants. We know exactly what's going on in 4B. We know what the people over in, in, in 16A are dealing with. We knew the property inside and out. And we also were able to stay below market in our turnover because we were able to keep people around because we gave that personal feeling about what was going on because we really honestly did care. We, I would not have had that empathy and had that, that ability to push that through to the guys that, that I had working for me if I hadn't done that myself. So I couldn't concur with you more on that, that, that 
knowing it, it's not that you have to invent the nut and the bolt, but knowing how to tighten it, knowing how to, you know, how to deal with that, knowing when somebody says, well, you know, I do property management, but I charge $65 for a call and I charge $100 for a call after midnight. All you got to do is unplug three toilets at midnight and you understand why it's worth a hundred bucks. You know, uh, I mean, there's, yeah, yeah, there's no hardware store open. You, you can't find any, it's the middle of the night you were sleeping. It was that one night of the week that you get the good night's sleep. Tomorrow's your day off and you're chasing down toilet parts at Home Depot. I mean, all of a sudden the world becomes very clear as to what that value is. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Andrew, what, what would be a, another piece of advice that you would give people looking to get started? I mean, the easiest thing, if you want to get into real estate is start with a house hack, you know, doing a house hack, you're buying it as a primary residence. So with an FHA loan, you only need three and a half percent down. Right. You know, most folks, when they want to start in real estate, they don't have capital and they don't have the experience. And by doing a house hack, you learn about analyzing a property, you learn about buying a property, you learn about working with insurance agents, loan officers, realtors. You need not as much capital to get into the property. Then you learn about managing the property, doing updates to it. I mean, to me, that's the best place to get started. Yeah. And then, you know, I know you're a real estate show like, like mine, but I always tell people, if you don't ever want to be a big real estate investor, you just want to get ahead financially, do a house hack or two you know, for five years, for seven years, it'll make a huge impact to your financial foundation. It'll let you pay off all that consumer debt or that student loan. That'll let you max out those retirement accounts early and set you up for a comfortable life down the road. So that's the other big piece of advice I give to folks that want to get ahead financially. I say do a house hack or they say, I really want to learn about doing real estate. I say, go and do a, do a house hack. Well, and you know, the reality is, I mean, I've, I've coached enough people and you have too that, that are terrified of doing something. But when you talk to them about having Steve and Larry live with them, because Steve and Larry already live with them, it's just that the, the, the loan is in their name versus the lease. All of a sudden the light goes on and people seem to understand that, oh yeah, this isn't as scary as I thought it was. And actually I can do this. And that that's always a great start for people to get their feet underneath them and to realize that, you know, like I did when I was 19. I mean, we, we had, you know, it was, it was Jeremiah, Steve and myself and, and the dog and we had no idea what to do, but we knew to buy a house and that was where we got started. And that's the kind of stuff that, you know, it's all of a sudden it's not so scary anymore. Yeah, especially nowadays with the University of YouTube, no matter what problem you run into, <laughs> something not working, you can go find it on YouTube. You know, so if something does break at midnight in, in your house hack, you can go on Google and find a guy that's an expert to tell you how to fix it uh, for free. So Yeah, yeah. You need a, you, you need a paper clip and, and some gum and uh, 20 minutes and you can, you can figure out how to fix that for sure. So now that you're, you're done with the single family stuff as far as, or the, or the apartments and, and, and more focused on the syndication, what would you say that's done for your, for your um, thirst for real estate? Now that you're into, into the big, you're, you're into the big leagues, Andrew, you're in syndications. It's done a couple of things. It's, it's definitely actually increased my thirst even more. I mean, it's let me get into deals and do deals that I wouldn't be able to do on my own. It lets me invest in multiple geographic areas. You know, I'd have to go back and look, but I probably have investments now in seven states, six states, um, wow. and sometimes multiple properties in a state. So, like, that's not something that even if you wanted to do, it'd be super challenging. You'd have to have this whole support network. Even if you had property managers, would you want to deal with six different companies, property management companies in six different states? you know, finding those deals, building that deal pipeline. So it's definitely increased it a lot. Um, I still really love value add. So um, I don't invest in C class anymore, but I'm majority in that sort of B class, A minus. So it's helped me, you know, diversify in that way. And then it's also freed up my time to do some cool stuff where the fourth house act that I did that we're, we're living in right now was a home that was built roughly in 1900. And it was the first time ever going through the historic renovation tax credits. So we just wrapped it up. We're, we're finishing out our application for 
uh, state tax credits and also going to go for the federal tax credits. And that's something awesome. that because I had that, that other investment, it let me focus on more challenging, complex problems that, you know, I like figuring out new things. I like the new challenges. So it's sort of cool that it, one is blowing my mind that I had the potential to have about 40% of my renovation costs given back to me in tax credits, 20% from the state and 20% from, from federal. So that part's just absolutely crazy, but it's given me that ability to be like, here's a really cool project. Let me go, you know, work on a hundred plus year old property, help r restore it back to that, you know, um, appropriate time. So it's given me that, that ability as well. That's awesome. You know, and, and it is funny when you have uh, time to look around, you know, you always see things that you might, you've always, maybe I would like to do that. See, for me, renovation, that's not really what I want to do, but I do have other things that I, that I use tax credits for that I really appreciate because I have a little bit of time to look around. I'm not nose to the grindstone. I'm not that $250,000 guy with a 34% DTI and can't figure out how to get lower than that. Uh, you know, and, and I'm stuck in my job and I, I don't like my job. You're able to look around and you're able to see things just like that where you can take on, I mean, a historic house, man, what a, what a killer thing to do. And New Orleans is so historic and beautiful. I'm sure that you've, you've had, just a ton of fun doing that remodel. Yeah, there's a little stress too. I've been, you know, completely uh, transparent about it. But yeah, that, it, you know, when, when you come into challenges, I mean, literally we were, you know, should have been finished right at the beginning of March. There was one or two delays that pushed us back till early April and then COVID happened and then it stretched out the project till May. So, you know, but because I had other income coming in, because I had decent reserves, that stress all of a sudden wasn't stress like it normally would have been. So yeah, it's been a re really cool opportunity and fun project to work on. I mean, we're, we love New Orleans and everything that it offers now. And we, we thought it was so much fun to help restore this house in a historic district. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Well, uh, Andrew, where can, where can people find you? I mean. You, 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 you've got your show. Where's that at? The House Hacking Podcast. We've got, you know, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. It's all out there. And then my website is F-I-B-Y-R-E-I.com. So Fibirea, which is, you know, getting a financial independence through real estate investing. Wow. I'm not going to try and remember that, but you guys heard him spell it out. So you guys know where to go. But Andrew, I want to thank you for coming on the show. I want to give you any, any last closing words, any, any last piece of advice for my listeners? Use real estate to help pick out and get you what, what's important to you. If it's a Lamborghini, use real estate to get that. If it's just simply to have more time with your family and send your kids to college and not have debt, you know, real estate can help you do that side of it as well. So. That's awesome. Well, thank you, Andrew, for your time. I appreciate you stopping by the House Hacking Podcast.